what is going on? Back with Coach's Corner, and I've been diving into these specific topics. Uh, and this one, specific, I couldn't write it because it's kind of long, but it's, it's basically habits for semi-private personal training. I would even say, you know, this most successful semi-private personal training coaches. I would even say that this probably goes for any type of group training, by the way, right? So even large group training, small group personal training, uh, but it, it does get into specifics a little bit more in semi-private personal training. Now, when I say habits, I really also mean skill sets, right? These are things you can develop. And one of the things that I wanna really point out is a lot of times coaches will say stuff like, well, I'm not this way, right? It's like this limiting belief, like I'm not this way, I'm not as charismatic, I'm not as outgoing. And we're gonna touch on those things in here, right? Because those are very, very important. Those are skill sets that you can build, okay? So uh, let's start here. I probably start every one of the teaching lessons with this one, which is, is be prepared at a start of the training session, right? Which means be pro, come early. Um, I'll give an example. Now that we have technology, and again, whether technology is, you know, the client has the app on their phone with the program, you're seeing that a lot, right? Where whether it's quick coach, whether it's uh, a train heroic, whatever else it may be, where it's like they can pull their program up, okay? Now for us, what we're moving to is for coaches having iPads, being able to click on a client, have the program in there, and being able to show them what they have. Now the thing is, again, it's, I think it's important, especially with a, new, with a new client and or a new program, where you do an overview, right? Being able to just give them an overview of what you're gonna be doing today, what the focus is, uh, for example, like if the volume went up, went up, if it's a deload week, it's an intro week, whatever, whatever else it may be, right? So, but again, the be prepared, like we talked about this quite a bit um, in previous vlogs, but meaning, you know, I, I talk about four by six cards, which is for me, I've always been prepared with stories, specific things for clients, you know, things that I want to bring up, you know, client wins, shining a light on good things that they've done in the past week, the past month, you know, getting stronger, so on and so forth, personal things right, whether it's they've achieved something, but also it could be something to do with their family, kids, so on and so forth. You know, this happens in the preparation phase, and uh, you know, again, four by six cards, but also things like having a CRM, being able to look up who's coming in, uh, you know, if it's a new person that you actually have not sat down with, right, because it might be in a group, somebody else sold them, and came to your program, so those are all the different things I think that, that matter when preparation. Preparation is a big one, and you guys know, right, preparation prevents piss poor performance, this is always true, and I truly, like as I speak around the country on these topics, I always find when I talk to coaches that most people are not prepared enough, and the more that you prepare, right, the better off you'll be, which leads me to number two. Greet clients by name, and then just in general throughout the training session, throughout the day, use the name as much as humanly possible, and you know, still to this day, when you, when you go back, one of the books that we have all our interns and coaches read is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, and he talks about that the sweetest thing that a person can hear is their name, right? And uh, if you saw my model for group training, I say you gotta say each person's name at least five times, right? That's for group training. But in semi-private, again, always greet clients by name, and Blake is over there, so be like, hey Blake, what's going on? It's great to see you. But then throughout the session, using the name. Especially, again, in semi-private, you're gonna have clients be, you know, throughout the gym in maybe different areas, being able to also say the name, say the coaching cue, do something like that. And the thing is like, look, by the way, some of this also comes through, I mean, shout out first of all to um, Craig Rasmussen and the Results University team, Alan Cosgrove, because some of this, it's things I've learned from them over time. And so, you know, this is what is an important thing is like, being proactive and not reactive, okay? What does that mean? Like not being passive and, and the amount of times like, that I'll go to a gym and get flown out for consulting for a couple of days, whether it's you know, to revamp, look at group training, things of that nature, and, and stand and see a coach being passive. Right? So if I got three to four semi-private training clients and I'm either you know, just being passive, doing something else, not paying attention to them, you know, hands crossed, do, again, maybe leaning on equipment, like we'll, go, we'll get back to that later, um, that and, and also in waiting for a client to say something to you, right? So to me, that's like, you know, being uh, reactive is like client comes up to you, says something, hey, something's a little off. That's being reactive, right? Proactive is being constantly on, okay? Working the floor. Now, again, you can go to Big Box Gym and see like how many people are working the floor, 
right? So their, their head is on a swivel, they're always going around, there's a lot of touch points. And by the way, because technology is a factor these days, if for, for example, if they have a program saying like, hey, did you watch that video? To me, tech is like for online coaching, for people that like, that's the value of an in-person coach, right? That you're very hands-on. So when I hear that, like, hey, did you watch the video? Don't ever do that, right? Show, and we'll talk about showing, okay? From there is like focusing on the ABC squared rule. So if you remember Glenn, uh, Glenn Gary Ross, it's a, a big sales movie, so if you're in sales, you would watch that, and ABC meant always be closing. That's not what it means here. Okay, so ABC squared means number one, always be coaching. And the second one is always be connecting, right? So always be coaching and always be connecting. And this is going back to, you know, working the training for all times and being engaged. So if, you, if you're on the floor, if I'm here from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. and I got semi-private training clients, I'm always engaged in coaching those clients, right? Always. So if, if you have a time, and by the way, uh, a great strategy, I was just in a CamFit Pro speaking about this and asking coaches to film their own sessions, right? Mic themselves up, film your own session to see yourself, how engaged you are, the language that you're using. Are you, ha you, know, are you spending either you know, uh, long periods of time where you're not with a client? That can all be seen and it's an assessment, right? It's kind of like a mirror model. And so I think that's something that's very, very important. In, a question, this, Craig brought this question up um, and said, you should ask yourself, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Right? What am I supposed to be doing right now? Because usually that will like trigger a focus and that focus will be like, oh, I, I ought to be coaching right now. That's what I should be doing, right? I should be engaged with the audience. So remember that ABC rule, when I say always be coaching, always be connecting. Connecting can sometimes mean when somebody has a break and connect with something like, hey, notice you were at the Sounders game yesterday. Right, awesome, like, I didn't know that you love soccer. It's like, well, yeah, my son plays soccer, and so I took him out to the, oh man, that's awesome. Hey, listen, by the way, uh, their performance coach trains here, I'm gonna make sure that they get a jersey, right? It's, it's a way to connect, so you're always coaching and always connecting, so that's my rule, right? I, uh, on clients at all times, as much as humanly possible, and uh, minimizing blind spots. Okay, so for example, that might be, you gotta be aware of your space, but, if you have a person doing a double kettlebell clean, you know, and, it, and they're on the other side of the gym where you can't see them, that's probably a no-go, right? So yes, people sometimes, if you look at uh, the bigger round gym, right, it's like deadlifts are over there, you know, squats are in another place. And I may have people in different places, but I'm gonna be in a position where I'm coaching and I can also see things, right? Which means you gotta be very, very focused. It means you can't be messing around, okay, but again, Eyes on clients at all times as much as humanly possible. Of course, you can't be perfect. It's not gonna be all times, you know, but it's more of a, again, intent. Because if you have intent, you'll be able to do that. And always, like demoing for clients often, right? I see this a lot where sometimes at the beginning or if somebody is a beginner, you're demoing things, but after that, you're not demoing things, okay? So that's why I say often. People are very, very visual, right? And being hands-on and obviously like, being a coach and being in the gym, I think that's a, the huge value of it that you're, uh, you're able to be hands-on. So many, many times, even through, so if I'm doing a group session, I will stop and show, right? If somebody's, uh, I will coach them up, but I'll go like, hey, right now you're here when you start, but I want you to have your head all the way up to the ceiling and I want you to lead with your hips first, right? And not lead with your back or head. So I'll show it and I'll show, this is what I call about, you know, the mirroring is I'll show wrong and then I'll show right. And so throughout the session, many a times, you know, you're gonna find yourself demoing because that is the best way that people learn. It's modeling, right? So again, people model you, and I promise you, bad demos equals bad results and it equals bad form. And so this, I, by, by the way, I, I should talk about this before, but so if you are demoing exercises that you are not very proficient in and proficient in coaching, that's a no-no, right? I've seen that too, where you see a cool exercise, you haven't really done it a lot and you haven't kind of owned it and mastered it, and then you're going to coach it. So I think this is a very, very important thing to ask yourself because again, people are very visual learners and a lot of times they're watching you do stuff, right? And, and learning that way. And so I think that's important that, number one, own what you do, demo more often and find yourself. I, I, I like tracking these things too. 
uh, where it's like, hey, how, how often did you demo in that hour, whether it was semi-private training or a group training session, okay? Develop trust, display confidence. We're gonna talk about tone, being loud, having a presence. And so a great book, by the way, is The Charisma Myth. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up because I think, you know, people will say things like, oh, well, you know, I don't have charisma. It's like, a, like it's a genetic thing, it's a trait. You know, you either have it, you don't have it, but you can develop it. You know, and charisma is three things. When you, when you read the book, it's presence, it's power, it's warmth, right? So when it comes to presence, it's really like, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds, but being where your feet are, right? If you're present, if you're curious, if you're listening, right? That makes somebody feel understood. It makes them feel heard. It makes them feel important and that's and appreciated. And that's a really, really important part. Again, without digging really, really deep into this, um, I would highly encourage you to buy that book. Number two power is that the ability, that person feels that you have the ability to move them forward, right? The ability to help them do something. And warmth is that empathy, that compassion. And again, these are all things that you can develop. So going back to charisma, because I think charisma is a, actually a very, very important thing. You know, when you look at coaches that have long-term success, have more clients, clients stay longer, they have more charisma. And if, if, when you know that it's something that you can develop, it's important. But going back to here, like developing trust, okay? There's a great, uh, in, you know, in sales, there's this thing that said that basically it's like the goal is to, uh, it's like, you want to you want to uh, transfer conviction over the bridge of trust right it's like a very very good visual right like the more that convinced that i am that i can help you so you know uh, again if i have conviction in the, what i do so in this case coaching getting you results helping you with your transformation getting you sustainable results i have to build trust right and rapport so that i can now transfer that and and so that this is an ongoing thing that you must continuously do but there but again is doing it uh, the faster that you can do it the better you can help that client and you know confidence comes from that's why for, for example like if you if you look at group training and this is a this is something that you have to constantly practice but is if you're you know in a class and like hey guys like uh, all right if you can do this versus having a louder voice regulating like making like, again tonality right that that matters because it creates that confidence in that presence and, and at times that means if like somebody's talking over you when you're coaching, I'm like, hey, can you please quiet down, be respectful, right? And you're asking them to do that, but you do that with a loud voice that's not disrespectful. It just is, again, showing that you have control, showing that you have presence. This is very important. It's definitely important as soon as, it, you know, when, when it comes to like group training. And again, semi-private personal training, for us, it's up to four, sometimes even more than four people, which then means, guess what? Like, I'm going to have to have some uh, some control and be able to practice this, which um, tonality, frequency of voice, like those things matter. I'm, I really highly encourage coaches to practice that and work on speaking because it's going to transfer over to your coaching skills. Okay. The, from there, I want to identify the most coaching intensive risk intensive exercises at any given point in time. That, that's one thing. So we coach a lot of people um, in the gym world to transition from just group training and one-on-one to like semi-private coaching and the moment that they go like hold on okay so there's three to four people that each have their own program that i'm coaching tell me how that works because you know if i have a person that's doing you know deadlifts and i have another person that's doing squats and i have another person that's doing whatever else it may be how am i coaching all that and so you have to basically be able to regulate you know if i have somebody doing a safety bar box squat two box and i have another person doing a trap bar deadlift that are two technically, I would say, more demanding exercises, and especially if the loads are gonna be higher, those people will not be doing it at the same time, right? Which, again, you control that, where I can be standing here and going like, hey, Tim, you got a minute, you still got a minute, let's do those ankle dorsiflexion drills, let's do those calf raises, get you a little bit more, uh, I would say, ankle mobility before you go to the next set of squats. Boom, and then I'm gonna start coaching Mary up on her trap bar deadlift, right? So I'm coaching Mary up, and the thing, thing is, Mary does her set of four, boom. I'm like, all right, Mary, you got your super set with, of push-ups. I don't have to uh, coach those push-ups as much. It's not as risky or technically coaching intensive exercise at that point in time. Boom, I'm gonna go coach 10. So that means it's a very, very uh, 
that semi-private coaching, group coaching should be something that's very intense from a standpoint of like moving around, being engaged, head on a swivel, right? But this, again, allows you to, uh, I would say, have a model and, and practice, practice and experience is what's gonna get you to be better and better at this. Um, one thing that I, I, I didn't mention, but I had a little note of it here that goes back to you know, coaching and sound is being, commun being able to communicate on a very simple level, which means that you need to know your stuff, right? Meaning you need to know your stuff from a standpoint of I'm trying to communicate the uh, importance of protein and not get super geeky with it, but go, hey, you know, protein is what's gonna help you with maintain and or build muscle, right? It's actually one of the key things that we, we need, but also it's going to make you feel fuller, right? So you won't have as much hunger craving. And then number three, it's a very, I would say, um, uh, thermogenic food, right? So you burn more calories as you digest it than you do the other, right? So again, I, I gotta know my stuff and then I gotta communicate it clearly and simply, right? In a simple way and not like, hey, I'm so smart, let me use these big words. And also, I love to use as many stories and analogies and similes to get this across, right? For example, um, let's, let's just take an, uh, an example of the bathtub analogy when it comes to stress, right? When people are, are uh, for example, they hit a wall, they're not getting results. I say, hey, look, here's what's happening. Imagine that there's a big bathtub and each, I would say, valve uh, of water that's going in is, is one is training, one is sleep, one is your stre you know, stress from work, stress from family, uh, food, so on and so forth, right? And if the, wa the water's filling up faster than it's going out, what is happening is like we have to figure out which valve to turn down a little bit, okay, or maybe shut it off, and that's gonna regulate our stress, right? And then you're gonna have better results because otherwise the water's gonna spill over and the water spills over, that's when you get an injury, that's when you hit a wall, and so if I can explain these things in a simple way, right, then the person can take that and go like, oh, okay, cool, I get it. And so that's, that's coaching and again, skill sets to develop. That's why I said coaching habits is actually building your skill sets up, right? So you gotta build those skill sets up. Displaying great body language and having a head on a swivel. So that's your coaching posture. So things that are always a no-go, right? Hands in pockets, that is almost pretty much always a no-go, right? This one, all right, that can mean that can be very, very closed off. Leaning on equipment. I'm not gonna say that, you know, that to, for instance, sometimes sitting down is fine, but if I, if somebody's sitting down a lot, that, that doesn't mean that means that they're not coaching, right? But again, coaching posture. In coaching posture, again, this is active, like hand, you know, hands on your hips. I could be I could be watching. I'll talk a little bit more about. 180 degree coaching, right? If I'm, if I'm coaching somebody just from, you know, from the side, everything might look fine. But then I'm looking from the front and it's like, you know, this knee's collapsing. Or I look from the back and their hip is shifting hardcore to one side. So I'm gonna do 180 degree coaching, which means I'm gonna move around to see what's going on. And I'm gonna have a coaching posture, right? Also head on the swivel. Head on the swivel to me means it's like, I'm coaching somebody intensely. And I'm going like, hey, Eric, that look, man, way to smoke that, way to push the ground away, put the weight up. Let's go fives up on each side, man. That looked really, really good. Let's keep going up with that, right? My head is on a swivel, right? Like Jenny, hey, listen, 20 more sec seconds on a break and we're gone, we're pushing that 300. So I'm always basically engaged and my head is on a swivel and I'm always watching. Level changes, level changes are important for a number of reasons. It's active, but especially like for instance, if I'm working with kids, a lot of times I'll come down here, or I may come down here because I'm watching something happening, I'm looking at the foot a little bit closer, then I'm coming up, right, then I'm moving around because I'm doing 180 degree coaching. So that is the coaching posture, right? And again, making sure we're always observing, don't lean on stuff, it's active, it's not passive, right? Passive to me is like, uh, you know, whether it's a group or it's a semi-private, like I blast the music, I put the workout on the board, three, two, one, go. And then I'm just looking at the time, right? And I'm not coaching, that's passive. Active is I am coaching. So the more people there are, the more intensive it's gonna be. But that's also why the semi-private coaching model, the small group coaching model, right? It allows you to coach many more people, impact more people, make more money, it's better for the business, right? So again, 
think about the coaching posture. This is why I'm a huge fan of like filming yourself or you know, having somebody observe you and um, I would say, when I say judge you, it might seem like bad, but somebody observes you and checks you, right? And, and not just coach you, but assesses you and gives you uh, an out of 10 score for the things that you're doing. I think that's very important. By the way, this is a, a great thing that you can do in your business if you have a group of people is that each coach observes another coach at least once a month in their semi-private session, or group session, and then writes out, hey, what did they do well? What could they do better? What was the energy like? Were they on time? Like basically they just assess them, right? Because now you're getting assessed by all different coaches and you're getting constructive feedback. Like here's the things you're doing good. Okay, cool, do more of them. Here's the things that are not going so well. All right, well, we're gonna bring those things up. Right, so this is an important part. And then, you know, being a chameleon personality-wise, there's, um, there's a great book. I'm definitely giving you guys a bunch of books, which is good, right? But it's an alter ego effect. And, you know, talks about, uh, and this will be an easy example, right? You have Beyonce and then you have, you know, Sasha Fierce. And the reason, like, that she gave herself that alter ego is because she was raised to be a lot more, I would say, calm and collected and not, like, you know, as vibrant and out there and sexual and so on and so forth so Sasha Fierce was the alter ego of that so when she did shows um, and there's a lot of great examples in there like from athletes that were very very calm but when they stepped on the field they were just like in a zone to crush people right now a chameleon personality to me is that like you're coaching a lot of people like we have you know 200 plus um, members here and some people by the way there's this like I always use this energy example on a scale of one to ten so some people will come in at a 10. My rule is usually if they're at a 10, I'm gonna bring them down a little bit, like usually by two points. You know, if they're a two, I'm gonna bring them up to four or five, right? If they're a one, you don't wanna just go like, ah, let's go, let's go. You know, that's gonna, that's gonna piss them off. But if they're a, a 10, you also don't wanna bring them down too much. Now, so the chameleon part of it is that, like some people are having a rough day. Like, I, I mean, I have an example from this week where one of my clients is going through a rough thing um, you know, a very serious, I would say, health medical risk in their family, surgery, um, you know, and, and they're going to the hospital a lot. Uh, they, they also work in the hospital, so it's a setting where there's just a lot of trauma and things of that nature. And I have to be, you know, put it this way, a chameleon in a sense of, one, I'm going to bring my energy down and be empathetic and caring and curious, but also, again, making sure that I'm giving the energy and support and bringing them up. I don't want to be a downer also, right? Like we want to bring them up, but also be understanding. Then, you know, you have some people that again, like in a better mood, something great happened to them, awesome, right? But even the difference of, let me give you another example where I have somebody that's a little calmer, or more conservative from the standpoint of music and they're older. So I'm going to talk to them in a little bit of a different tone. Like, hey, Susan, great job. How are you feeling today? You're a little bit sore from yesterday? Man, I, I love your consistency. Hey, you got a rebound workout today. I'm gonna to talk to her like that. Then it's like a former pro athlete. It's like, hey, Jay, what's going on, man? What's up? Like, I saw you training yesterday, uh, doing your volleyball stuff. Man, like, you're, like your vertical is definitely up. And then also I'm gonna talk, I might talk a little bit of shit because we have that rapport, right? So I'm gonna be a chameleon in those different ways and I have to be able to adjust that because I can't be the same for everybody, okay? And again, this is part, you know, experience, it's practice. Um, it's an observation and by the way, you know, this is an important one if, if if you say things like well, yeah, every day I'm talking to clients I always get I, I love to give the story of my buddy uh, Craig Weller who worked for Precision Nutrition He talked about um, You know when he was surfing and he said I was surfing for many many years and I, I became you know mediocre at best slash average and then I went to surfing camp for a week and I realized that I've been practicing things in a crappy way. So I've been, basically, I was repeating bad habits, okay? So I became really good at some bad habits, which you don't want. So in a coaching space, that's what happens a lot. People are like, well, yeah, I coach people every day and I communicate with people every day. But you may just be doing it in a way where it's actually, inst a, 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 I would say, instilling bad habits and getting good at bad habits. This is why you need to have people observe you. That's why you need to constantly study. This is why... You know, I'm, I'm sharing a lot of this stuff and to, to give you the insights that will help you become the better, a better, better coach. Okay, so uh, by the way, definitely read that book, Alter Ego Effect. Uh, I think it's very important. And this, the, these two are connected because you want to observe and model other experienced coaches. Now, there's a reason why we have an inter internship that's 12 weeks here at Vigor Ground, right? So 
you can basically shadow all the time like what are coaches doing because we want to we want to model that for you but it's not just that in house it's always going out and seeing other coaches my first 10 years of my career i went to so many events and seminars certifications and a lot of it was to watch the best and how they operate right i'd usually be there a day before go and train train with them pay watch and observe them running at youth athlete classes group training sessions one-on-one -on -one sessions and i'm taking notes like what are they doing how are they again what is their posture like what is their tonality like right again uh, is there specific things that they do that i'm not doing cool write it down so you really really want to observe you know what i mean and go out and observe and this could be in your local area who are the best people in your local area when you go to you know I would say the people in your industry that you're like, I really look up to them. I want to be like them. And I, I want to get like two different examples here. Um, I had Kyle Dobbs on the podcast. And when he started coaching and Equinox and like he's, you know, built multiple companies, one online, one offline. Now, he said, what I, what I did is I found out who were the top couple top coaches there. And then I did everything that they did. OK, they were there at 5 a.m. I got there at 5 a.m. They left at 7, 8 a.m. p.m. That's what I did. What did they do? How did they treat clients? How did they take the intake questionnaires? Like, what did they do in between breaks? Everything. And, you know, within nine months or so, you know, he was also one of the top coaches there. So, you know, that's one thing. And, and Alex Hormozzi says a, a great thing when it comes to just in general, like modeling stuff. Look at the person that you really look up to and, and you want to be, okay? And it's like, okay, do the things that they're doing and do them for 10 years. Right now, that might sound kind of like, ah, but that's the reality, right? Because for sure, if you can do it for that period of time and model those behaviors, you will be successful. You will be successful, right? Take it out further. But this is a big one, right? If you're not observing what the best are doing, like really observing, granular level, taking notes and seeing how they do stuff, you got to start doing it. You got to start doing it. This is, you know, any book by John Wooden, by the way, read it uh, because it's excellent. But John Wooden said, you know, a coach is a teacher and a teacher is a coach, right? So be a teacher and a coach and not a workout facilitator, right? A workout facilitator is like anybody can do that. And again, there's a big difference between education, teaching. Um, again, I also think like you should always be a student, right? But think from that perspective because what we're doing is we're instilling lessons in our clients all the time the way i look at it is like hey i'm going to see somebody three to four days a week you know 50-ish week, weeks a year that's 150 to 200 times that i get to teach them i get to coach them teach them instill lessons even change belief systems and that's going to add up so much that we can really really change somebody's mindset right the frameworks of how they look at the world but build their skill sets up right just think about you know, going to school. Because again, workout facilitator, like, hey, I got to work out. I'm going to blast the music. You know, I'm going to make you tired to go. That's not what we do, right? So that's very, very important. Again, read John Wooden's books. He was one of the greatest coaches of all time. I reread his books every year. And last one that I think is really, really important, you know, this also goes for online, but on online, you can have a form, right? Doing a daily readiness check with clients, okay? Uh, and what I, what I mean by that, like, yes, we all write programs for our clients, especially in a semi-private setting, but what if somebody had an hour of sleep, rough night, somebody passed away in their family, and then we have a really hard training session, right? We want to do a readiness check. And readiness check, a lot of times, will be just questions. How are you feeling? How, you know, are you sore? How was your, la you know, uh, sleep last night? From the training, you know, maybe it's a Friday training session, you've already had two this week. It's like, how are you feeling at, after this week? Scale of one to 10, how's your energy? And again, that readiness, uh, you know, when you, when you go to higher, level, uh, higher levels, you might have a play, you know, I would say a, a force play test where you're doing a counter mo movement jump without hands and to see what's going on with the CNS or a grip test or things of that nature, right? Where you can get some feedback from data as well, like, or HRV, uh, train with Morpheus. Like, so my highest, highest level clients that we really, really dig into and at my pro athletes, you know, will be things of that nature where like, where's your HRV at, your resting heart rate at? You know, you can do force play tests and things, uh, and things like that to determine the readiness. But I think a lot of times just having conversations, you know, when somebody's like, hey, it's been a rough week, you know, been studying all week for a test. Last night I slept two hours. You know, some friends came over, had a couple glasses of wine, whatever it may be. That's going to make you adjust the training session, see where they're at and be, be able to better to respond. And again, if it's online, you know, we're going to use as much data, but also a questionnaire. But in person, you can also see, you can see body language, right? Somebody's coming in, 
they're hobbling a little bit, you're like, well, you know, what's happening there, what's going on? You might, you know, very shift the training session significantly. And so these are all habits. Now, what I, before I finish this, I want to share this. You can break every one of these down into daily practices. And just like you wouldn't, I would say, give a client like all these things to do, you would go like, hey, let's work on certain things, right? And one of them might be like, let's just start, let's, let's find a point A on a GPS and let's film a, 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 a you doing a session. Film yourself doing a session and you'll get some feedback. Have a coach watch you do a session. You know, maybe some things, even as I'm speaking them out loud, you might be like, damn, um, I do a lot of this, right? Like you find yourself like, yeah, or I'm not doing this. Okay, so create an actionable step so that now you can start doing that. Like, what does that look like in practice? What does that look like in action, an action when you're doing uh, your next semi-private training session? So let's say you got four hours of semi-private training tomorrow and you're like, okay, cool. You know what? I'm going to use the client's names more often. My head's going to be on a swivel. I'm going to do 180 degree coaching, right? I'm going to change levels. Okay. You don't have to do all of those, but you can start doing some of those. The more you practice them, the better your coaching session will get, the more you get the feedback loop and the more you improve and you just start adding things. Again, because like, it's not like you, you're like, oh, I watched this video and all of a sudden like I'm doing all those things, right? This is, again, years of, I mean, it, it never ends. I've been doing this for close to 20 years coaching and I continue to try to get better at these things. And sometimes, again, there's stuff that I got to bring up. There's certain things I had to polish a little bit more. It's an infinite game. But this is the difference between, you know, building a career and being really successful, helping clients, making more money, being you know, having more impact and being more fulfilled with what, what you do. So at the end, you're like, man, I gave my best. You know, I really, I, I believe I was focused and intentional nine out of 10, eight out of 10, 10 out of 10, you know, every day when I coach. And by the way, that's gonna be a game changer because there's gonna be a contrast between if somebody coaches with somebody else and if somebody coaches with you. So again, nothing happens if you don't implement this stuff. And if you like this, as always, hey, subscribe and follow this channel. Drop in the comments what else you'd like to see, and I will see you next time in Coach's Corner.